Good morning, good morning. That's right, Walter, everybody up. <laughs> it's time for worship today. We're going to get warmed up in our flesh and in our spirit this morning. So if you'll stand with us, we're going to begin our service today by focusing our hearts and minds on the one that we're here for. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior wrong, that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing his praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. shall return in robes of white the blazing sun shall pierce the night and i will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on jesus face Praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus face oh praise the name of the Lord our God Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, our God. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore for endless days we will sing your praise oh lord oh lord our god oh lord oh lord our god oh lord oh lord our god amen he is god and he is good even you know sometimes technology just doesn't cooperate with us but we just keep singing because we're here just to worship him and if our hearts are in the right place then the rest of it just works out and 
We're going to continue this morning in our worship in this song about obedience and stepping out in faith even when we can't see. We were talking about this Wednesday night in youth, and the thing of it is, if you can see it, then it's not faith. Sight negates faith, which is why in the Bible it says that we walk by faith. That means how we live, how we do this life. We walk by faith when we can't see, and that's what makes it faith. Trust in him. You call me out upon the water, the great unknown, where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stand. And I will call upon your name And keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace For I am yours And you are mine Your grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you've never failed and you won't start now. So I call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves when oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours and you are mine Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me and take me deeper than my feet could ever wander and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. And take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. And take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior.
and I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves when oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours and you are
Good morning. Let's all stand. If you want to get a hymn book, it's hymn number 337. If not, it's on the wall. And thank you, John, for putting up these screens so that we could be able to see everything better. No, I am not Willie Bongiorno. She's still not quite feeling up to par. She's getting better, so thank you for your prayers. <clears throat> um, this is one I've done many times before, but on Wednesday nights, we're talking about heaven. And it's a, a series that we're going through. It's a really great series, and you, y'all can still jump in in the middle of it. That's fine. But Wednesday night, Kevin asked us, when we get to heaven, what do we want to do? Um, you know, we all wanted to praise God and praise Jesus, and we're, we're glad we're going to be see Jesus. And one said, well, we know now we're going to, then we'll be walking by sight, not by faith. Um, but one of the first things that we all said we wanted to do was just say hello to everybody up there.
Hello, hello. I've been longing to say hello, hello in heaven. Walking and a talking on the streets of gold, just want to say hello when I'm passing by the sparkling river of life. So many things I want to know, but first things first, hello. Well, hello, Naaman. How did you feel in the muddy river, Jordan? Hello, Stephen. How did you stand the stones without a word? Hello, John. What did you do when you saw great heavenly things walking down the streets of gold saying hello? Hello, Paul. What did you sing in the prison stall at midnight? Hello, David. Did you dance when Goliath bit the dust? Hello, Joshua. Did you shout that shout when the walls came a-tumbling down? Walking down the streets of gold saying hello. Hello, hello. I've been longing to say hello, hello in heaven. Walking and a talking on the streets of gold, just want to say hello when I'm passing by the sparkling river of life. So many things I want to know, but first things first, hello. Hello, Mama. How did you feel when you saw your children crossing? Hello, Daddy. What did you think when you heard Mama sing? Hello, children. I'm a thankful you chose the road to heaven. Walking down the streets of gold saying hello. But the most important, hello, Jesus. I've got a million years to praise you. Oh, sweet Jesus, my sins you did erase. Oh, Jesus, my Jesus, you've been so good to me. Walking down the streets of gold, saying hello. Hello, hello. I've been longing to say hello, hello in heaven. Walking and a talking on the streets of gold, just want to say hello when I'm passing by the sparkling river of life. So many things I want to know, but first things first, hello. So many things I want to know, but first things first, hello, everybody. Amen. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you for using God's talents to get us closer and connected to God and give us perspective. So y'all ready to go to heaven? Y'all ready? Yeah. Amen. Baptocostal, I like that. Yeah, I, I tell people, you know, if being charismatic um, means I'm more excited about God, then I guess call me charismatic, you know. Uh, but we, we could definitely have more room to be more excited about what God's done for us and that uh, he loves us. And so... Listen, I'm excited about today's message that's given to me. Um, we have been going through the book of John, and so um, we're going to actually be talking about heaven um, in this uh, text today a little bit. So um, speaking of that, um, you know, but before we get there, um, you know, just like we can be on the bad side of people. You ever been on somebody's bad side? Or somebody been on your bad side? Um, so too, we can end up on the bad side of God, um, of heaven, um, if we're not a believer, you can be on the bad side, um, and it's very similar to ending up on someone's bad side, um, you know, in, in life. You know, if you're on somebody's bad side, it'll be kind of like that, and it's never pleasant. Let me il illustrate through a couple of stories here for you. Um, there was a man who died, and he arrived at the pearly gates, and uh, Simon Peter took his name and looked to see if his name could be found in the registry of the book of life. And St. Peter said, look, man, I'm sorry, but I really can't find anything on you. I can't even find one good deed listed about you while you're on earth. I tell you what, if you can tell me at least one thing you did on earth that was good, then the angels may let you in. Well, the man said, I can think um, of one thing right off the bat. 
that I did that was good. Now, one time I was driving down the road, and I saw a motorcycle gang surrounding this woman whose car had broken down. I pulled my car over, popped the trunk, and pulled out a tire iron. And I ran over there, pushed through all the members of that biker gang, and I said, listen, if you want to get to her, you're going to have to go through me first. I then bonked one of the 350-pound biker dudes on the head with that tire iron. And St. Peter said, wow, that's impressive. When did that happen? And the man responded, about three minutes ago. <laughs> I think that uh, man ended up on the bad side of that biker gang. Um, and then I also heard about a husband who had fallen ill with some very serious symptoms. So his wife took him to the doctor and, who examined him and ran a complete battery of tests. The doctor walked out into the waiting room to find that wife. And when he found her, he said, uh, she said to him, uh, give it to me straight, doctor. What's wrong with my husband? And the doctor said, well, your husband is going to die unless you take some special measures with him. And the wife said, well, of course, doctor. I will do anything to help my husband. Then this is what you must do, the doctor said. First of all, you must not allow him to have any stress in life whatsoever. So you must never argue with him ever again. In fact, you need to butter him up so much so by reminding him how him being right all these years has made you into being a much better wife in life. And you also must fix his favorite meal, meals three times a day. Let him play at least one round of golf a day. Smother him with hugs, kisses, and love all day long. And tell him how much you love him every day, at least 21 times. Give him whatever he wants or needs. Spoil him rotten and wait on him hand and foot. And if you do all these things, your husband will live. So all on the way home, the husband said to his wife, Well, honey, what did the doctor say? Am I going to get well? Without missing a beat, the wife said, I'm sorry to say this, but it's terminal. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but that man must have already been on the bad side of his wife. Uh, if she wasn't willing to do all those things, right? <laughs> now, listen, there's an even more important person here in our midst that we want to end up on their good side. A person even more important than, than that, those members of that biker gang or that wife mentioning that story. A more important person even than our spouse that we want to please this morning. So if we take um, our Bibles this morning to John 18, if you don't have your Bibles, that's fine. We'll have it up on the PowerPoint. John 18, we're going to take a look at some passages of Scripture uh, verse 12 through 14 and 28 through 40. And so we've been in the book of John for a little while. I'm trying to time it just right to give us a pace to where we end up um, at the resurrection scene on Resurrection Sunday for Easter Sunday. So that's kind of the plan there. Um, so speaking of that, we're actually bringing a guy next week, uh, thanks to Chris Kling, who's going to actually be doing the uh, Passover meal from a Messianic Jewish standpoint. So almost the entire service will be given over, and then we'll do the Lord's Supper together. But you're going to learn some pieces, some deep pieces of why the Jews do what they do. But he's a Messianic Jew, which means he's, he's Jewish by race, but he's a, a Christian, born again Christian uh, by faith. So he'll be presenting that next week. So we're going to change gears a little bit um, to pace this out. So anyway, going into verse 12 here, uh, it says, So the soldiers, their commanding officer and the temple guards arrested Jesus, and they tied him up. First, they took him to Annas, and since he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest at that time, Caiaphas was the one who had told the other Jewish leaders, it's better that one man should die for the people. And so we see here uh, that Jesus is taken here in these early hours. I want to show a picture here. of I don't know if you realize this, but there was actually six trials of Jesus Then he goes to the house of Caiaphas, position number 
number three, and then he goes up to number four and five here. Um, so the Sanhedrin would meet and, and try him at sunrise and uh, there at the temple, and he finally chooses three, the four different gospel accounts. And then he goes up to number six, he's tried before Pilate, and then goes to number seven to Herod's palace, and he's tried before uh, Herod, and then back up to uh, Pilate, and you find those um, in those respective verses. But so Jesus is journeying and traveling through a lot of different uh, trials before different people. Uh, and by the way, number five, this was um, taken from the website, but number five, that scripture, actually I looked into this, that scripture should actually be a number five, Luke twenty two sixty six. 66. Uh, the author of that picture uh, put 63 for some reason, but it should be, it should be 22, 66 if you want to write that down. And also number six, so the scripture reference should be Luke 23, 1. I missed it by um, a few verses there. But so number six is to back that up. So I'm real big into backing everything up by scripture. So that should be Luke 23, 1. But as they sent him back to Pilate, um, there's something interesting here to note that that day Herod and Pilate became friends. Uh, before this, they had been enemies. Isn't it interesting that a trial over an innocent man made two former enemies friends? Isn't that interesting? That's very interesting. It's interesting how two evil leaders become friends over the handling of an innocent, pure, and perfect person. Um, now, did you know today, before this, that there were six kind of separate trials or stages of Jesus? Anybody here know that? You went through that kind of extent? Well, good. I'm glad you came here to learn something today a little bit. I want to show verse 13 here to John, if we could do that real quick. Uh, thanks. That was very quick. Uh, it says, first they took him to Nan Annas. Notice that? First they took him to Annas, since he was the father-in-law. Isn't that interesting? You ever catch that? Why in the world did you take... Jesus to be tried before somebody's father-in-law. I mean, what position did he have that would be so important to take him to Annas before the high priest, who he should be taken before to be tried, right? Well, I want to give you a little backstory that you may not know about Annas. It's kind of interesting because the backstory or bio on Annas um, will help you understand the dynamics or the shaping of this mistrial of Jesus um, because you're going to learn that Annas already didn't like him. That's why it's strategic and why he goes to Annas first because Annas already didn't like him. Didn't like him. Why? We'll find out here in just a little bit. Who was Annas? Uh, and why did Jesus have to appear before Annas? First, just because um, he was the father-in-law. I'm trying to decide whether I should roll up my sleeves like I'm ready to go to a fight or something. We're getting into scripture. What do you think? Roll those sleeves up or, or roll, keep them down? What do you think? Vote? Vote. One of each. That looks kind of awkward. That might be so distracting, we might not even get the message. Um, <laughs> eat a can of spinach. That's right. We want to build our spiritual pipes up here, brother. Listen, who was Annas? Well, first, Annas, he did serve as high priest at one time between uh, 6 and 15 A.D., 6 and 15 A.D., before being deposed or removed by the person who was the Roman governor of Judea at the time. This is before Pilate. Before Pilate came on the scene as a Roman governor, it was Valerius Gratus. Valerius Gratus was the Roman governor of Judea. So even though Annas served at one time as high priest from 6 to 15 A.D., um, it's interesting that other scriptures, when Jesus was around, um, elsewhere in scripture, um, they still refer to Annas and Caiaphas as serving as high priests together, such as in Acts 4, 6 and Luke 3, 2. Why do they categorize Annas and Caiaphas as both serving as high priests? That seems to be a contradiction. If history tells us he only served between 6 and 15. You understand what I'm saying? Because in uh, Luke 3, 2 it says, The word of God came to John the Baptist during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. So what in the world's going on there? How could he be concerned high priest, and we'll go to that in just a little bit. Um, so in Acts 4, 6, it mentions that too. So in Luke 3, 2, and in the subsequent trials with Peter and so forth, Annas is not serving in an official capacity, but he was still head over the high priestly clan or order, and so he retained the honorary title that was meant for life. Let me, let me illustrate. It's similar to how today we refer to any former living U.S. president as president. Does that make sense now? In other words, it's an honorary title when you see other scriptures that may be apparent to contradict what history shows. He was not serving as high priest during that time frame. So Jesus was brought to Annas rather than Caiaphas first, uh, who was the official high priest serving that year. But he was brought before Annas because Annas had tremendous influence and input behind the scenes. In fact, so much input and influence that over the next 50 years, seven members of Annas' family would rule as high priest. So he had a lot of say in who got chosen next, including five of his six sons served as high priest, as well as his son-in-law Caiaphas. 
So you don't think this man wielded tremendous influence and power? You better believe he did. In fact, so much so, he was going to, have, he was going to see Jesus first in this line of order of seeing people. Annas was also a key player in Jesus' trial because he was a member of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin, this was an aristocratic and religious ruling order, and they were, very, they were known for being very arrogant, ambitious, pompous, and having enormous wealth. In fact, the first century historian Josephus recorded that the Annas family had a monopoly on both the market stalls that sold sacrificial animals as well as the money exchange tables that Jesus had overturned. Ah, now we're getting somewhere. Finally, Pastor Kevin, you're <laughs> getting there, yeah. In fact, the first century historian Josephus refers to the monopoly of the Annas family that they held on these market stalls as this. The four booths of the sons of Annas, which were located on the Mount of Olives in the court of the Gentiles at the temple. So he had four of these market stalls. They had a monopoly on it. So as you see, one can understand why Annas had a problem with Jesus. Do you understand? Because Jesus upturned and overturned those money-changing tables at the temple. You see how Annas had it in for him now? You see how the shaping of this mistrial is coming to fruition in the stage here? They've got a problem. Annas has a very serious problem. Not just religiously, you know, but also economically. Because he's both, he served both as high priest and didn't like what Jesus was teaching religiously because he's taking crowds away, but also economically, Annas was an entrepreneur. And Jesus was affecting his, uh, the amount of money he was bringing in by doing stuff like that. You know, ruining and pushing over vending, his vending machines, if you will. So we see, what I'm saying all this is this, translation quickly here, Jesus was not on Annas' good side. But neither was Annas on Jesus' good side. And the thing is, you don't want to stay that way. You don't have to stay that way. Listen, so Jesus appeared to Annas first, Caiaphas second, and then Pilate third. And so it says, so Pilate the governor went out to them and asked, what is your charge against this man? Um... We wouldn't have handed him over to you if he weren't a criminal, they retorted. Then take him away and judge him by your own law, Pilate told him. Only the, Romans, um, only the Romans are permitted to execute someone, the Jewish leaders replied. This fulfilled Jesus' prediction about the way he would die. Then Pilate went back into his headquarters and called for Jesus to be brought to him. Are you the king of the Jews, he asked him. And Jesus replied, is this your own question, or did others tell you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate retorted. Your own people and their leading priests brought you to me for trial. Why? What have you done? And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would, fit, would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. And Pilate said, so you are a king. Jesus responded, you say I am a king. Actually, I was born and came into this world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. What is truth? Pilate asked. Then he went out again to the people and told them he is not guilty of any crime. But you have a custom of asking me to release one prisoner each year at Passover. Would you like me to release this king of the Jews? But they shouted back, no, not this man. We want Barabbas. Barabbas was a revolutionary. Pray with me. Lord, we just pray in this short time we're together that we could walk away with perhaps at least one thing from this set of Scripture that we can apply to ourselves to make us better disciples. But I also pray, Father, for those who don't know you as their Lord and Savior, that they wouldn't stay that way when they die, so they wouldn't end up on and stay on your bad side, but they would be converted and then become on your good side. We pray, God, your spirit would move. I don't even have to pray that your spirit would move because you're already moving, but I simply agree with you in what you're wanting to do at this moment. So, Jesus, do what you want to do. In your name I pray. Amen. Listen, Annas, Caiaphas, and Pilate ultimately did not listen to Jesus, and so they were not on Jesus' good side. They were not on Jesus' side at all. Um, Jesus said in that verse, if you caught it earlier, Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Another version. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Listen, even though Pilate came out in Scripture in three different Gospels, he actually declared Jesus, by the way, to be innocent seven different times. Did you know that? Seven different times. That's interesting in itself, a divine number. Seven, seven different times. 
That's interesting in itself, seven different times. Um, but even though he declared Jesus innocent seven different times, Pilate still had a hand in pushing Jesus forward into the further proceedings by letting the people have what they want. But here's the question of the day. Are you on Jesus' side? Are you on Jesus' side? Because if you died today, do you know if you would be on Jesus' side? If you die on Jesus' side, you die on the good side. Or perhaps are you on his bad side? Because there's ultimately only one way that we can be on Jesus' good side today, and that is to be saved. That's it. How do you get on Jesus' good side, you ask, perhaps? How do I get on Jesus' good side, Pastor? You have to be saved. That's the only way you can be on Jesus' good side. I can't say that enough, but it's very simple, very clear. The Bible makes it very clear. There's only one way here this morning to be in right standing with God. So how do you get in right standing with God? You have to be saved. <laughs> you have to be saved. Listen, here's point number one. You are on Jesus' good side today if you have obeyed the gospel. If you've obeyed the gospel, in other words, if you've listened to the truth, that's what Jesus was saying, by the way, to Pilate, if you listen to the truth. That's the truth we're talking about. It's the truth of the gospel. Because no one can obey God perfectly all the time. If perfection was demanded to be saved, no one here is going to be ever be saved. So when Jesus says, listen to the truth, he's not saying just listen to the truth and you've got to obey the truth every single time, then you'll be saved. No one's going to be obey the truth in that sense or listen to the truth perfectly. No one does that. It's listen to one truth, that's the gospel, the gospel truth. Have you listened to the gospel and then obeyed it by accepting Christ in your life? That's what we're talking about here. Listens to the gospel and then accepts the gospel as both true and into one's life. And so everyone here, you're on one side or the other. Let's make no bones about it. You're on one side or the other. Everyone is, here is either on the side of truth, in other words, you're on the side of the gospel because you accepted the gospel into your life by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You believe who Jesus is. You believe why he came. That's to die on the cross for our sins. He did the cross work, not crosswords. He did the cross work, right? And you've personally accepted him as your Lord and Savior. And when you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've been transferred from God's bad side to his good side. Now, a lot of people wouldn't say that, say, God, I don't have a bad side. Well, according to Scripture, if you think about it, he actually does. You can be either on God's good side. It's not much different than, you know, um, if somebody said to you, listen, are you, on your, are you still on your dad's good side? It's kind of the same way of saying that. You know, are you, in other words, are you in good standing with your dad? Or is there still animosity or strife in the relationship with you and your father? That's what we're saying here. And just to prove to you through scriptures that God does have a good side and bad side. Bad side meaning that uh, you're not okay with him in the sense of a judge or him being um, a judicial over your life. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.21. This is the NIV version just to prove to you. Okay? It says, God made him... That's Jesus. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might what? Become the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God. Listen, if you're righteous before God, you'll be on the right side of God. You're on the right side of God. Here's another translation. The New Living Translation says it this way. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So again, did you know there's two sides? To God? God has two sides. Here it is. Listen, the scriptures actually say there are only two sides to God. There's a left side and there's a right side. That's what I'm talking about. Because many of you may think, what you, what's he saying? There's a left side and right side. Well, listen, Matthew 25, 31 to 41 says this. Check this out. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, when he comes back, right, he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Here it is, ready? He will put the sheep on his what side? His right side. So I'm just proving to you, he's got two sides. And the goats on his left side. So I'm not too far off the beaten path, right? I know a little bit what I'm talking about here. Listen, then he will say to those on the left side of God, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And then let's look at here. Um, in Matthew 3.12, he not only stops there, um, you know, because, and interesting too, by the way, that which side were the sheep on? The right side. That's right, the righteous side. And so will you be found today? Will you be found on the right side when you die? Um, if you're a sheep of God, then yes. Okay, because God refers to um, 
you know, sheep and goats. He also compares his right side, left side to wheat and tares or wheat and chaff. Um, he also says you don't want to be a weed with God, right, when he comes. So Matthew 3.12 says this, His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. In Matthew uh, 13, 30, it says, At that time I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Listen, uh, weeds is not a good place to be positioned with God because you're on the wrong side. Um, because the bad thing happens, eternal fire. That's, that's a bad side with God. To end up there is to be on God's bad side. So God does have a bad side, I'm saying. Um, here's another thing that you've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the light. Colossians 1.13 says this, For he has delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of light, the light of his dear son. Praise God. There's been a transfer slip that's willing to be given to you if you um, accept Christ as your Savior. John 3.36 says this, and again, all these verses are just showing there is a difference between dark, light, right, left, okay? So uh, John 3.36 says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. So it's like it's following us all our life, God's through His grace is calling people to Himself, and those that obey the gospel, accept Him as their Savior, then they're in good graces with God once they receive that. But if we reject Christ and say, I don't need Jesus, there's many ways to heaven, I don't need the Son of God in my life, well then you're rejecting God's only provision that He's offering for you to be saved. And then God's wrath remains or waits for us. And listen, by the way, if, if, listen, I've experienced wrath of different people, and it's pretty bad sometimes to experience that, but it's nothing like the wrath of God. We don't want to end up there, experience that. And so again, these verses are pointing out the two sides of God. So if you're found on God's good side, you'll receive the key that gets you into the vehicle of eternal life. This past week, um, I had trouble getting into my Honda Pilot because the key I have, the battery's dead in the little key thing. You call that a key fob, F-O-B, key fob. And so that's meant to unlock your doors. And so not even the key won't even go all the way into the uh, side door. It only goes halfway, and I can't turn it. And so we had to go to a, a locksmith to um, try to get that battery replaced. And so he said, you know, it's stripped. Uh, it's corrupted. It, it, won't, it won't open up. And I got to thinking that, you know, um, the great thing about Christ is when you receive him, that battery power will never die or go out. The door is always open here this morning. Listen, you can go through and have that vehicle and get in and have the car start up. That's one thing that's different about the key fobs here. They go out. The light of your life, Christ, he will always open the door. It's never shut. You'll never lose your salvation. And so, listen, the guy told me that if you put that key, it may be just going to be lubricated. I got to thinking, well, the Holy Spirit is my lubrication life. That It'll always turn, and I always get in with the Holy Spirit. I had so many different analogies that God was giving me, and that Christ is the ultimate locksmith in life. That there's no door he can't open. If you're here stuck, God is a locksmith. He'll get you through that door, barrier, whatever it is, even besides eternal life. He can open the door for you today, whatever it is you're having trouble with. He's got the great key fob and the answer for you. Listen, we're so fortunate to have the key of life that can open the door uh, for us. Here's number three I want to share with you. Um, I'm reversing the, the order and the outline because I got to thinking number three on your bulletin actually fits in line with number um, this next point I want to make a little better. But number, number two here, so if you are on Jesus' side, you'll never be charged guilty of any crime. If you're on Jesus' side, if you're on his right side, his good side, he'll never ever charge you guilty of anything wrong that you have ever done in this life. Look at, uh, he says here, Pilate said, what is the truth? Then he went out again to the people and told them, he is not guilty of any crime. Jesus was not guilty of any crime. But you have a custom of asking me to release one prisoner each year at Passover. Would you like me to release the king of the Jews? Listen, Jesus took the charge of being guilty of crimes he never committed so we could be free of all the charges we were guilty of. Isn't that great? That is great news. Through three of the Gospels, Pilate declared him innocent seven different times. In other words, Jesus took on the bad side of God, his wrath and guilt, the left side, so we could experience the right side. So Jesus now looks at us as totally forgiven, justified, and as if we've never sinned. That's what it means, folks, to be justified. It's just as if you've never sinned. 
I want to show this video I showed um, this past Wednesday, but this is a different segment. So if you came Wednesday, you'll still see a different segment. But Dean Braxton experienced death for two hours. He was clinically pronounced dead by the doctor, and he's a believer, and he talks about his visit in heaven during this time. But one of the things he's seen, not only was Jesus, but how Jesus viewed him. Maybe you're here today and you're having trouble truly believing that God can forgive you for whatever you did. I want you to see this video clip and watch what Dean said Jesus revealed to him and his response. There's two different segments, by the way. You need to come to realize that you really are children of the light because there was no darkness in that light at it's, all. It's brighter than anything. It's anything. brighter than, yes, yes. Talk about the landscape of heaven. We well, do not have vibrant colors, yeah. lime. Yeah. Talk about the landscape. You know, one of the most amazing things about me when I first got there is that it, everything's alive. There's nothing beautiful. Everything is alive. I've gone through the scriptures and pointed out like the in the sixth chapter of, of Revelation where he talks about the seven thunders because even the atmosphere is alive. And it doesn't say something sounded like thunder. It says the seven thunders spoke and the dawn was told, no, we can't talk about it. You know, there's an eagle flying around in the eighth chapter proclaiming things. So you know that the atmosphere is brighter than you can ever imagine. You need to come to realize that you really are children of the light because there was no darkness in it. Not only did you see heaven, but I want to jump to, to this. You came face to face with Jesus. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. I want to focus on that because I've talked to people that have been to heaven, but not everyone that has visited heaven has had an experience with Jesus face to face mm -hmm. with Jesus. Mm -hmm. You had a conversation. Yes. I, well, what I said to Jesus when I first saw him is I looked at him and I said, do you just miss me? Coming to the realization, the only reason I was there Jonathan, is because of what you had done. Not even my words got me there. And so he said, what do you mean? I came to understand, even me right now, talking to you. It's him, you and me. It's him going through me. Who gets the credit? I don't get the credit. And the Bible tells us to do everything as we do unto the Lord. So I came to understand that not even my words got me in. Jesus got me in all the way. And all I could do was say, you did this. You were a believer already, but this was a new dimension. Oh, this was oh, heaven. And then the next things I said were this. I said, thank you, 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 thank you. You know, and everything about me was praising him. I always tell people the first thing I was praising him for was this. He looked at me like I'd never sinned in my entire existence. Like I never did anything wrong. When he says that he forgives you, he forgives it. He knew all this already, that you were born again. Yeah. That you still couldn't believe it. He knew this already. You, you, you know a lot of these things, okay? But the reality of it is, do you really believe it? You know? And all of a sudden, it was more past me believing it. It was, I was experiencing it. You know, to experience Jesus look at you like you've never sinned in your entire existence, it gives you no reason to walk on this planet with any bare burdens on you about what you did in the past, even Amen. though God can forgive you for it. Amen. Amen. Listen, some of you need to hear that today. Some of us, we believe in our heads, but we haven't got fully into our hearts. That He really, when He forgives us, totally forgives us and doesn't look at us as if He's partially forgiven us. And so we need to hear that. Listen, that's the great news. Listen, and, and not only that, God's not only given us the key, to the key to heaven, the key to the kingdom, to advance it. And He's not only forgiven us of all the things we've done, so we're declared not, no longer guilty. But here's a final thing. When you're on Jesus' side, proof of it is that you now serve a, a new kingdom, and it's not of this world. That's proof. So there should be proof. There should be, we should be bearing fruit that shows that we have this new life, that we are wanting to advance the kingdom, that we're about God's heavenly kingdom, not this earthly kingdom. And so that's the final point. If you're here today, proof that you're on Jesus' side is if you're serving the heavenly kingdom, if you want to be about the church and advancing the kingdom. So Jesus, you know, he not only claimed to be on the right side of God, he spoke the truth, but he gave evidence of it by serving God. In other words, he served God through being kingdom-minded. He was part of advancing God's kingdom every day, not just some of the days. He was, Jesus was not a worldly person or a Sunday morning, Sunday morning only a, a tender. He, he came, he was about the kingdom every day in some way, ministering always. Jesus said this in the scripture, My kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. Are you serving a kingdom outside this church that's your own kingdom? Are you more 
heavenly kingdom minded than you are earthly minded? Or are you more earthly minded and earthly kingdom focused than heavenly minded? Listen, I close with this story, this illustration, because I can't think of a, a better one than Jeff Keaton in his book, The Life of Radical Faith. And I recommend to anybody, The Life of Radical Faith. Jeff talks about how hard it was for him to go to Hollywood, Florida and become the pastor there, but he did. And then once he got established, he's seen God move and do great things. But then after years of being there, he received a call from a pastor friend of his named Steve in Roanoke, Virginia, and said, I want you to think about being the pastor here. He's been, he said, I've been fasting for 40 days, and he said, God's moving me on, and I felt led to call you. To which Jeff said, no thanks. Eight days later, God said that, you need to call him back. And so, so Jeff calls him back and says, well, okay, so I guess I'm open to this. And then long story short, Jeff and his family moved to Virginia. So what I'm saying is initially he didn't want to do that because he was more earthly minded. But to be heavenly minded, you have to be willing to give up your comforts, your familiarity, and be able to move on to a different place of location of service sometimes, in this case for Jeff, and be that kind of open mind to be kingdom minded. And so God gave him this vision once he was there at Parkway uh, Baptist Church up in um, Roanoke. And God gave him this vision with three numbers, 1,000, 100, and 10. He said, you're going to raise up 1,000 new disciples. Wouldn't it be great if we raised up 1,000 new disciples through Pathway Discipleship this coming Saturday, eventually? Listen, 1,000 new disciples at Parkway, he said. And then he said he, 100 people were going to be called to full-time ministry associated with Jeff. And then he said, your church is going to plant 10 other churches. And sure enough, um, they, have, they have done that. But one of the people that he began to look towards when he's hiring somebody for a secretary was this lady named Linda. He felt God nudging him to hire her and she, because she said, you know, the things she said, she was more about the mission of God than just looking as a job, you know, to pay the money, pay the bills. Um, but Linda eventually started taking mission trips with this church she was secretary for. And she went to the Ukraine with her 15-year-old niece. And so God began to use that and confirmed to her this call to missions on that trip. And so now Linda, who started as secretary at this church, is now the president of the missions department at Jeff's church. So, you know, God has, you know, um, them um, with their hands with missionaries in Ukraine, and we need to continue to pray for those in Ukraine, because there's missionaries over there right now, by the way. There's people over there that are our brothers and sisters, and we should be concerned for them. So that's why I wanted to use that story, by the way, for more reasons than one. But there's so many different stories that Jeff used, such as a guy named Troy who quit lucrative golf ball business, a lucrative golfing business, he gave it totally all up to help Parkway start a Christian academy. And so there's all these people that came and went into full-time Christian ministry that was making this vision prove true that he gave Jeff. Why? All because he was more into serving God's kingdom than his own. Listen, God has more for you today than you realize, more than you ever thought you could do or ask. As Tammy lives in that song at the very beginning, that he just wants us to get in the boat, get on the waters, this faith that he has Listen, I close by saying this. There's a lot of sides you can get on, a lot of teams you can get on in this life, but there's no better team to be on than the winning team. There's no better team to be a part of than any, any, any NFL team that will win the Super Bowl and experience that or any major league team that um, will win the World Series. And um, by the way, there's no lockout in heaven. Listen, there, there's an NBA team, the Dream Team, whatever team that you thought was so cool that they won, you know, the World Series or the NBA championship. Listen, the kingdom of God in the end of life, that championship that we're all going to be a part of and that we participate in, that is going to be the granddaddy of them all, of all Super Bowls, all World Series titles. That's where it's at. That's where God's asking you to put stock in. And so if you don't come on Wednesday nights, I encourage you to come on Wednesday nights. If you um, want to be involved in missions and advancing the kingdom, come Saturday. There's so many opportunities to grow in your faith, but the opportunity I have before you now, before we close, is the opportunity of a lifetime is something greater than winning the lottery, it's to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because you can't buy eternal life, you can't work for it, you can't earn it. He simply wants to give it to you for free. And so what you have before you is the opportunity of a lifetime. That's how I want to share the gospel, folks, out there in the community. I want to tell people, listen, you have before you, what I'm about to share with you is an opportunity of a lifetime. And so if you're here today and you've never accepted Christ, receive an experience of a lifetime, one that will last on into eternity. So close with me. Lord, we come at this time of decision-making. Anytime your word is preached, you're working in the heart in conjunction with that scripture. And so, Father, where are we at today? First of all, where are we at?
do we have anybody here today that's not on your good side yet because they've never accepted you as their Lord and Savior? And for those of us that are on your good side, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, everything we do, you, you approve of in the sense of our behavior, but what we have to understand and get down, Pat, is the distinction that just because we might sin or fail you, it doesn't mean that you reject us as um, a person, that you may not approve of the behavior, and we may be out of fellowship with you, but you'll never leave us or forsake us, so we're always on your good side in the sense you're always for us and not against us. You'll never leave us or forsake us. And so we thank you for that and that truth. So, Father, at this time now, wherever we are, if we haven't been serving you at full capacity, we're not involved in church and advancing the kingdom like you, we know we're supposed to, and your Holy Spirit is urging us on to taking that next step, whether it be uncomfortable or not, if our heart's open to you, you will help us to take that next step. And Holy Spirit, you have a way of speaking to a congregation of 100 people and speaking to them to 100 different ways. You have that ability. I don't. But you have a message for each of us here right now. And we have to make a decision. Do we want to move forward with you or not? So, Lord, help us to decide for you. Help us to step on the right side. And that's being in direction with you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Just grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love. Amazing grace. The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace.
The earth shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine. But God who called me here below will be forever mine will be forever mine god you are forever